Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Ethan, and I'm going to be talking about how uh, we're signing and verifying container images uh, in a Kubernetes environment at Datadog. So this is a talk about Datadog's internal infrastructure, but this infrastructure ultimately supports the Datadog product, which is a, an observability and security platform. Uh, we run at a very high scale, and I have a few numbers at, uh, on, these, on this slide to uh, illustrate that. But the important thing to remember for this talk is that uh, we run on self-hosted Kubernetes. So you have hundreds of clusters, uh, tens of thousands of nodes, and hundreds of thousands of pods. Uh, so the solution that we, um, we design for uh, signing and verifying images needs to work at that scale. A bit about me. Uh, my name's Ethan. I'm a senior software engineer at Datadog. Uh, where I've been working on infrastructure security for about four years now. Uh, so if you have any questions um, about the talk, feel free to approach me afterwards, or you can reach me at the address on this slide. So why should we care about signing and verifying uh, images? Uh, on this slide, I have a simplified model of what an internal software supply chain looks like targeting a uh, Kubernetes environment. So it has all the components you'd expect, uh, version control, CI, CD, uh, con a container registry, uh, and then the various components of Kubernetes. Um, but uh, as, as, a, as an organization matures, each of these stages uh, is often served by multiple subservices. And as the complexity grows, this means that you have more surface area that you need to secure. Um, and each of these stages is, uh, is a target for malicious code injection. So an attacker could uh, inject a malicious payload at any stage in this pipeline and uh, that might reach prod eventually, um, allowing that code to run, even if the attacker doesn't have uh, direct production access. So what signing and verifying images gets us is a guarantee of provenance. So if we sign an image in CI and then verify it in one or more downstream uh, systems, what this provides us is a guarantee from the perspective of the verifier that the image that it's handling uh, is bit for bit the same as the image that was uh, built and signed in continuous integration. So the overall goal is to uh, push signing as far as possible to the left, as close to build time as possible, and push verification as far as possible to the right, as close to runtime as possible, to, uh, to extend the scope of the integrity guarantee um, of that signature. Uh, in the past, there have been a variety of approaches to uh, signing container images. Um, but the ones that have achieved the best adoption uh, all have an architecture, architecture uh, pretty similar to the one I've uh, drawn on this slide. Um, so the common property is that the registry that's used to store application images is also used to store signature metadata. And this is made possible because um, registries following the um, OCI specification uh, are actually able to store data that's not what you would normally think of as a container image. As long as it fits the spec, you can store essentially any kind of blob, including signature metadata. Uh, the signing itself, signing and verifying itself, is achieved through public key cryptography. So uh, the signing client uses a private key to generate a signature, uh, and then a corresponding public key is used by the verifier to, uh, to verify that signature. Um, but the way in which you distribute public keys to the verifier is, is largely left to the, the implementer. Um, there's really no standard uh, read of trust to, uh, to connect the signer to the verifier. Uh, and there probably never will be, um, because each organization is going to have its own, uh, its own threat model and its own um, preferred way of handling secrets. Uh, so I've, I've spoken generalities here, but, um, but two, um, two systems that you might have heard of that, uh, that have this high-level design are uh, Six Doors Cosign and uh, Notary V2. And the system that we've, we've built at Datadog uh, also has this high-level design. So we're using this, the uh, container registry as, as storage for signature metadata. And this stands in contrast to some of the earlier approaches that used uh, more traditional databases. So there's a few interesting things to say about this. Uh, first, I think the success of this, this design is largely because uh, container registries aren't a, a new runtime dependency. And this makes the, uh, the system easier to adopt and more reliable because there's fewer, there are fewer moving parts and you don't have to, uh, for example, manage yet another database. Um, but at Datadog, uh, one of the reasons that 
using the registry for uh, storing signature metadata was a particularly good idea for us is it allowed us to build on an existing replication platform. So uh, we run a number of uh, isolated data centers. And by design, there are very few systems that are able to transfer data between these data centers. Um, and notably, one of those is the registry, because we need to be able to build an image in the build data center and uh, transfer that image to all the runtime data centers where it will eventually run. So by uh, pushing signature metadata to the same registry, uh, we get to reuse the same replication mechanism to distribute that, uh, those signatures everywhere that the verifiers will need them. It's important to note, though, that um, taking advantage of this, this fact uh, doesn't come for free. Uh, because we're replicating signatures to all the same places that images will run, um, we're doubling both the replication load and also the number of stored images. Uh, so you definitely need to be mindful of any registry quotas that you uh, may need to comply with before you start um, signing images. So we discussed storage, but uh, what do the signatures actually look like? The format that we developed at Datadog is loosely based on uh, SigStore's cosine format. But uh, before we dive into the specifics, I want to give a quick caveat on why we, we ended up building our own. Uh, it's almost always a best practice to, um, uh, to use an open standard when it comes to cryptographic designs, uh, especially if you need interoperability, such as if you're um, signing uh, images that will be distributed in an open source setting. Uh, however, at the time that we implemented all of this, uh, Cosign was still pretty new, and uh, there was no reigning standard yet for signing images. Um, the sign and verify operations of Cosign at the time uh, were only available in a CLI, and we knew that we would need to override a lot of the uh, uh, low-level functionality of those operations uh, for compatibility with our internal systems. So I know that there's a lot of ongoing uh, work in the SIGSTOR community to uh, build these uh, low-level libraries that expose these, uh, these components in a modular way. So um, if, we were to start, if we were to start again today, uh, it's pretty likely that Cosign would have worked for us out of the box. So I'm going to describe the signature format from, from the inside out. So at the very core is the signature payload, and uh, this is what we're trying to protect. Uh, the format that we, that we ended up using is the OCI descriptor, which uh, contains the digest of the, uh, of the signed image, the media type, and the content, content size. Um, additionally, there's a, a key value map available uh, called annotations, and we use that to store uh, and, and, and also sign the, uh, the timestamp, as well as a number of claims about the um, identity, uh, the, the internal service identity of the, of the signer. So that payload is signed using um, the ed25519 algorithm uh, in HashiCorp Vault. And uh, that signature is wrapped up in a signing envelope uh, using the dead simple signing envelope spec. So this is a spec that was developed for the Tuff and Toto projects, also CNCF um, projects. And what the specification gets us is um, a data structure that combines the payload with uh, a number of signatures. Um, as well as a standard spec and um, uh, ready-to-go libraries for, uh, for building these envelopes and, um, uh, and uh, verifying them. So to, um, to store these envelopes in a signature that we can uh, push to a registry, uh, we combine them into an OCI image manifest where um, each layer represents uh, one envelope for one key. And uh, we annotate each layer with the key ID, uh, which is just a fingerprint of the public key for um, easy lookup during verification. So that's, the, um, that's essentially the uh, data structure that you know, takes the place of a container image. So we need to push that to the registry. And the, uh, the location that we push that, that signature um, artifact to is a transformation of the location of the artifact that's being signed. So we, um, we add a prefix to the repository path, and we convert the SHA-256 digest uh, into a tag. And this is a little bit different than the, the, uh, or the approach that Cosign takes, um, in that we, uh, we add this, this uh, repository prefix. 
And what this gets us is a, a dedicated registry quota uh, on, on these signature images, uh, independent from the quotas imposed upon the signed images. Uh, this, this gives us just a little bit of isolation in terms of you know, the volume of, of uh, images pushed versus signatures pushed. So to produce these signatures, we've chosen to encapsulate signing in, uh, in a service. So at a high level, we're pushing handling of keys and signature metadata behind an, an RPC service um, that is, that is uh, you know, more hardened than, than uh, CI is. Uh, so jobs in CI that are uh, building and signing images use a thin client to send an authenticated RPC to the signing service uh, over TLS. And then the service responds to that um, by uh, building the payload um, using HashiCorp Vault to actually sign it, um, and then wrapping it up in, this, in the uh, metadata format that I just described and pushing that back to the registry. The thin client that uh, CI jobs are actually using is a, a CLI that we call DDSign. It looks pretty similar to Cosign if you've used that. Um, but we've designed it to be simple have a um, extremely stable um, API and uh, additionally easy to integrate into many CI pipelines. So there's not many options here to configure. Essentially to use it, you just call DD sign sign and then the uh, a reference of the image that you'd like to sign, including a digest. So you know, you're signing you know, exactly one image. Um, and we also have helpers for specific types of, of image builds to make integration especially easy. So for Docker built images, we have an option that uh, pulls the digest directly from the local Docker daemon in CI. Uh, so you don't need to write complicated shell scripts to do that. And uh, we also have a, a, a custom Bazel rule that we use to assign Bazel built images. And uh, this approach of having a signing service and then a thin client in CI has, has worked really well for us. And um, I'm gonna touch on a couple of the reasons why we particularly like it. So first, uh, compared to if CI jobs were signing directly with HashiCorp Vault, um, we have much better control of key usage and uh, we get richer audit logs. So on the side, um, I have an example of what it might look like if we are signing directly in CI with HashiCorp Vault um, without the signing service. And the Vault audit logs, although they're you know, solid, uh, in terms of the payload, they only contain an HMAC of the signed data. Uh, which is opaque and hard to interpret. Uh, we can't, for example, um, filter them uh, in, 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 uh, after these logs are collected uh, based on the signed artifact reference or something like that. So in contrast, um, when the key usage and metadata handling is uh, pushed behind a service, uh, we can now apply a uh, least, least privileges uh, principles to uh, the CI jobs that are requesting the signing. This means that they don't need direct signing access in Vault, and they don't need to um, have direct access to push uh, signature uh, metadata to the registry. They only need to express their intention to sign the artifact to uh, the signing service, and then the, the uh, hardened signing API takes care of the rest. Um, as an example of the kind of audit logs that we can get out of this, uh, we. Um, we have identifiers available for the CI jobs that are requesting the signing, uh, and also parsed out fields of the, of the signed artifact for easy filtering. Another benefit of signing in a service is that it encapsulates most of the complexity of signing behind a single deployment that we can dynamically update. Um, updating clients in CI is an incredibly tedious and time consuming process especially when you consider that there are many branches, some of which might be behind the trunk, and you can't update those directly, et cetera. So we really don't want to have to update clients in CI frequently. Um, as an example of a big change that we're able to make um, without touching clients in CI at all, uh, we introduced, um, we introduced a uh, deduplication uh, feature in image signing. So we were looking for a way to and reduce the load that we're putting on the registry uh, caused by signing images and pushing those that metadata to the registry. And we found that uh, only about 3% of the image signing requests that we were receiving were for brand new images. And we think this is because our reproducible builds were, uh, were 
um, you know, re rebuilding the same image at different points in time. So by changing the logic of handling an image signature request to first verify or attempt to verify uh, signatures for the current key set, and only if that verification fails, you know, produce another signature. Uh, by introducing this, this logic, um, we are able to divert most of the, the registry load to the read path, which is uh, much less expensive. So this was, a, this was a huge performance and reliability benefit to, uh, to image signing. Um, additionally, um, uh, in this design, key management is also completely transparent to clients. So you can do things like rotate keys uh, without updating CI. And to some extent, Vault provides this abstracted key management. Um, but we found that we needed to implement several features on top of the features available in Vault. Um, for example, uh, if we need to sign with multiple keys in, uh, in one signing request. So that's about all I have time to say about uh, image signing. So now on to verification. So if you have to consider, um, or if, if you only have one, uh, if you have to choose one point in your uh, software supply chain to verify signatures, um, there's a bit of a, a trade-off that you need to consider. And that is the earlier you sign, pardon me, the earlier you verify an image, uh, the faster you're able to get developers feedback. So you can, for example, uh, stop a deploy before it even starts if there's a benign uh, image uh, signature verification issue rather than stopping at mid-deploy and requiring a rollback. Uh, in contrast, the closer to runtime uh, you verify a signature, uh, the better security properties you get, because the integrity of that image is guaranteed over more systems. And uh, the, tr the trusted compute base after uh, verification is much smaller. So ideally, you would verify in multiple spots to get the best of both worlds, both fast developer feedback as well as uh, better security. The typical recommendation that you'll see in open source for um, image verification is to do so in the Kubernetes control plane uh, using admission controllers. But at Datadog, uh, we made the choice to, to verify at the node level within the container runtime uh, with supplemental pre-deployed checks for that, that fast developer feedback. So to explain why we opted against uh, using Kubernetes admission webhooks for image verification, uh, we need to understand how they work. So admission webhooks basically allow you to write custom, piece of code, custom pieces of code and run that code to determine whether creating, updating, or deleting uh, Kubernetes API resources is allowable. And there are several kinds of, of admission webhooks, but the typical choice for um, this kind of problem is the validating admission webhook type. Um, the important thing to realize here is that the latency of, of uh, the code that you're running in a webhook is added to the baseline latency of handling an API server response. And this is because the API server uh, blocks on a webhook um, to return its response before returning its own response. Uh, and in the large clusters that we're running at Datadog, um, we're really careful about avoiding uh, introducing back pressure on the API servers. So uh, the latency goal that we have for admission webhooks is about 10 milliseconds at the P99. Unfortunately, though, uh, image signature verification is an online um, or somewhat online uh, process since it has to talk to the registry. Uh, and this is quite hard to fit into that latency budget. In practice, the latencies we see for image verification are actually closer to uh, 200 milliseconds at the median. So this on its own is enough for us to rule out uh, admission webhooks as a solution here. But um, another disadvantage of the approach is that uh, using the registry for signature metadata uh, introduces a new uh, cluster level dependency. So whereas previously the registry was only a dependency at the node level for, uh, for pulling images, uh, it's now on the hot path of the control plane. So this has, this has some pretty serious uh, reliability. Um, reliability, uh, or ch changes to rely the properties for reliability. So one workaround that you could consider here is uh, using a different kind of admission webhook, the image policy webhook. And this is, this is 
one that has built-in uh, caching and retry features. So for example, it would uh, patch around intermittent verification failures. But uh, we're not very comfortable relying so heavily on a central cache like this to meet our baseline performance goals. Because if that cache were to be cleared for any reason, uh, the API server could be put into a, uh, a state of metastable failure where it's, it's unable to keep up with the request volume necessary to rebuild that cache and get back to its, um, get back to its uh, normal operation. So the alternate design that we chose was to verify image signatures in ContainerD. So as a refresher for the architecture here, uh, ContainerD sits one level below the kubelet and receives commands from the kubelet like uh, create container or start container over the container runtime interface, or CRI. So ContainerD is the process ultimately responsible for uh, resolving an image digest, pulling that image from the registry, and unpacking it to disk. Um, to actually run the image, uh, ContainerD defers to a lower level runtime like, like run C over a shim layer. So the obvious place to integrate image verification into this flow is right after resolving the digest and right before pulling the image. This is pretty much as close as we can get to runtime as possible. So we minimize the trusted compute base after signature verification. At Datadog, we truly believe that the container runtime is the most appropriate place uh, to do image verification. Uh, so we're pretty excited to see momentum pick up uh, around this discussion in open source. Uh, for example, Cryo and Kata container runtimes, I think as of recently, both have uh, support for verifying six store signatures on pull. But at Datadog, we use ContainerD, so um, we've taken the initiative to uh, contribute these features upstream. Uh, the basic approach is to um, add an image verification plugin system to ContainerD. So users of ContainerD can supply custom bits of code that um, ContainerD would call to determine whether pulling an image is OK. So if the plugin returns a response saying the image is OK, or the signature is verified, for example, uh, ContainerD would continue the image pull as usual. Uh, whereas if the plugin returns a response saying that the image is not OK, ContainerD would bubble up a, an image pull error to the kubelet. So because uh, the kubelet sees an image verification error as a type of image pull error, uh, this means that we benefit from all of uh, the features in Kubernetes for, uh, for pulling images reliably. So for example, at the node level, we have the, um, the kubelet's image pull retry loop, which um, in our case would uh, retry, retry to patch around intermittent verification failures. And we also have the uh, pod feature of image pull policies, um, which allows us to cache image verifications at the node level. So if a container has to restart, for example, um, you wouldn't need to do a second image verification. Uh, additionally, the latency concerns that we had in the context of admission webhooks are not applicable here, because image, pull, or image pulls are expected to be slow. Images are quite large sometimes. And uh, all of these systems are built with that in mind. Um, an important thing to note, though, is that the only reason we're able to pursue this architecture at Datadog is because we're self-hosting uh, Kubernetes. Um, so we have access to all these, these low-level components on the node. Uh, so if you wanted to implement an architecture like this using a, a managed Kubernetes cluster, uh, cloud providers would need to um, expose this, this kind of image verification uh, configuration at a higher level, but uh, we're pretty hopeful that industry will move uh, in this direction eventually. So we've been running a temporary fork of ContainerD with an implementation of this idea implemented, and uh, we're working with the maintainers of ContainerD to get these features into uh, the 2.0 release. So if you're interested in following along, I have the, the link to the tracking issue here. Um, there are some PRs there, but just uh, note that the uh, implement implementation details were not yet finalized. So this slide shows the developer's perspective on, on uh, the image verification system. So if you try to run a pod that has all signed images, everything works as usual. Whereas if uh, there's any um, unsigned image in a pod, the pod is put into an image pull error state. 
And developers can get full details on, on the issue uh, using pod events. And because this is a uh, new and potentially confusing error for developers to see, um, we've made sure to make the error messages as friendly as possible and also included an inline wiki link for, uh, for support and escalation. So the last thing that we need to talk about for image verification is how we're distributing the config for verification to the node. So in order to verify an image signature, the ContainerD plugin needs several pieces of information. Uh, first, it needs a trusted public key set. Um, and this, this is dynamic if you consider key rotations. Uh, second, it needs a verification mode. Uh, so we need the ability to put the system into either um, audit mode, where it's only checking but not blocking anything, uh, blocking mode, where it would reject images that aren't signed, or a disabled mode to disable the entire system. And additionally, we'd like to configure this at a, at a relatively granular level so we can be in different modes in different parts of our infrastructure. And finally, we need to distribute an image digest revocation list. So because our signatures don't have um, expirations, uh, we need to be able to um, revoke them in some way. And typically, we would prefer to, um, to revoke image signatures using a public key revocation. But this is a bulk operation, since public keys are used over multiple signatures. Um, so if we only have a handful of images that we want to revoke signatures for, um, we would prefer a revocation list for this use, use case. And our requirements for distributing this configuration are uh, mostly guided by reliability. So we don't want to introduce any new node level dependencies. Uh, we need the ability to roll out this configuration in a slow and staged manner. And also, we'd like to have multiple fallback mechanisms for uh, configuring this, uh, uh, or distributing this configuration uh, for resilience. To distribute the public keys in verification mode, um, we've taken a layered approach. So uh, we bake a set of defaults into the node image, and this is kept relatively fresh using our automation for um, building and rolling out new node images. Um, but in order to uh, get faster updates than that, um, we also have a dynamic update system that runs on each node. And what this does is it periodically pulls um, a config map that sits in each cluster and mirrors that to disk. And we're able to slowly roll out this config map just like we would roll out any application to multiple clusters uh, for slow incremental updates to this conf configuration. Um, finally, we have an override config layer on disk that takes precedence over the dynamic update mechanism. Uh, this, allows us to do, this allows us to do pretty much zero dependency overrides if we need to. Um, and in general, this layered approach allows us to roll out config at essentially any layer of the stack. So we can continue to operate the system under a wide variety of, of incidental constraints. Um, the approach for distributing image revocation lists is actually a bit simpler. Uh, we, bake it, we simply bake it into the uh, machine image on, on build and forgo any dynamic update mechanism. Uh, just like how we bake defaults in for the verification mode and uh, public keys, um, this is kept relatively fresh using our node lifecycle automation. The interesting thing to note here is that dynamic updates for this revocation list wouldn't actually be useful even if we implemented it. And the reason for that is because ContainerD is caching image pulls or pulled images on disk. So if you wanted to purge our infrastructure of, of a, uh, a single image, we need to not only make sure that we don't pull it again on new nodes, but we also need to remove it from all existing caches. So in practice, our approach here is to prioritize draining nodes, so uh, moving workloads off of them and deleting them, uh, that have run the revoked image at any time in the past. So we're nearing the end of the talk, so uh, I want to close out by discussing some of the challenges that we've, that we've encountered rolling out this system and recommendations that we have for others heading down this path. I'll say the most significant challenge we faced uh, in rolling out uh, image verification is that you can't easily configure the verification mode uh, by Kubernetes namespace. So at the cluster level, um, namespaces are handy boundaries to separate different tenants in the same cluster. 
But because nodes can run containers for multiple namespaces on the same node, uh, we don't really have this boundary available to us. Uh, what this means is that you might need to sign all the images in a given cluster before you can turn on blocking verification mode. And this can be quite a challenge, especially in a large multi-tenant cluster, simply because there's more images that you would have to sign. Uh, what we found here is that having dedicated clusters for more sensitive um, types of workloads not only has uh, the obvious security benefit of, of extra isolation, but also this allows you to more easily sign all of those images in the cluster because there are fewer of them. And then you can go from audit mode to blocking mode in that cluster uh, sooner. Uh, second, in an organization with um, a lot of diverse CI configuration, it's a lot of work to globally add a new signing step to all of those builds, uh, even if the integration on each one is relatively simple. And what we found here is that monorepos and consistent build tooling like Bazel uh, make it quite easy to make sweeping changes like this. Um, and my recommendation in general for rolling out uh, image signing is one, to leave ample time for it, but two, simultaneously roll out uh, audit mode uh, signature verification. Uh, this not only allows you to develop operational experience for the verification system sooner, but also it will provide an additional source of telemetry for what images are signed where. Uh, finally, node-level image verification is relatively uncharted territory, so it's been a challenge to develop new techniques here. Uh, that said, we truly believe that the reliability benefits are well worth the effort, and uh, we're really excited to guide these features into ContainerD 2.0 so they're more readily available to everyone. So to close out, uh, three takeaways. First, um, evaluate whether encapsulating signing images uh, in a hardened service is worth the security and scalability benefits. This is very likely not the right decision for everyone, especially if you're only building images in a few places. Um, but in Datadog CI environment, there's no question that this was the right choice. Uh, second, uh, think critically about using admission controllers for complex verification processes like, like image verification. Um, at scale, you may come to the same conclusion that we did at Datadog and prefer the properties of image verification in the container runtime. Um, lastly, uh, these verification features are not yet merged into ContainerD. So if you're a user of ContainerD and you think you might use a feature like this, uh, I, I welcome you to join the conversation at the, the link on this slide and, uh, and give us your input. Um, that's all I have, so thank you for your time.